welcome you all for um, National His um, Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm delighted to let you know tonight that we received word from the city of Glendale. There <laughs> is going to be a proclamation sometime this month proclaiming that Glendale, the city of Glendale, recognizes National Hispanic Heritage Month. So we're super excited about that. Thank you to Anita and Marisol and Jenny Quinones and everybody who is helping with that project. And um, our next slide, Mr. Hernandez, we have a message here from our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Ekchian. I'm happy to be here today for the third event of our 2022 Hispanic Heritage Month Speaker Series. We're thrilled to have influential artist, muralist, and illustrator Ignacio Gomez with us today to share his passion with our Glendale Unified community. His passion for art shines deeply through his accomplishments. Ignacio's work aligns strongly with our district's goal of building confidence within our students and setting them up for success. I want to thank our Adelante Latinos leadership team for putting together this incredible program and for supporting and empowering our Hispanic and Latinx students. And of course, enormous thanks to our very talented speaker, Ignacio Gomez. Thank you, Dr. Ekchian. So I just want to direct everyone to our social media. Um, if you're interested in supporting Adelante Latinos or following us, please, we have a, an email account. We have a website, uh, which GUSD very lovingly shares with us. So we're appreciative to them, gusd.net slash Adelante. Um, we have a Facebook account. We have an Instagram. We have a Twitter and we have a YouTube channel. So please sign up for our YouTube channels and you'll be able to see all the speakers, not just from this year, but even from last year and the year before. So please check those out. And next slide, Mr. Hernandez. Okay, so um, on here we have the links to Anita Quinones Gabrielian's um, night and Dr. Carlos Haro, who was here with us last week. And then pending um, to after Mr. Gomez speaks tonight, we'll also have that video available on YouTube as well. And then we have two more speakers on the 6th and the 13th, Dr. Carlos Reyes Guerrero and Samantha Muno. Muno. And I just want to do a quick thank you to the people who introduced us to our speakers this year, Jenny Canuni Skinner, Natalia Lewis, Marisol Cianello, Dr. Adriana Guerrero Pastanji, uh, GUSD Adelante Latinos, Francesca Silva and Miguel Gonzalez, the co-chair people for Adelante Latinos, and Brenda Bessaril, our fundraising chair. Of course, our superintendent, our Glendale Public Libraries, who we love so much, and of course, our student moderator, Gia Giovanna Aldaz. So I will let Giovanna take it from here. Um, today, we're going to present Ignacio Gomez, an artist, sculptor, muralist, and illustrator of important figures in Mexican-American slash Chicano history. Ignacio was born and raised in East Los Angeles, California. His parents immigrated from Mexico. He studied commercial art at Los Angeles Trade Technical College and Art Center at College of Design before being drafted into the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. After an honorable discharge, he returned to Art Center where he received his BA. While still in school, Ignacio entered a contest in which two of his paintings were accepted and printed in the New York Times. This led him to having representation in New York City. Ignacio has taught Art Center and Otis Parsons School of Fine Arts. He has also lectured to students at Harvard University, California State University, UCLA, and various high schools, junior high schools, and elementary schools. He was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award for his work on behalf of the youth in the community by the Salesian Boys and Girls Club. Ignacio has created many educational posters for young Latino children, showing them as professionals. One of his most famous images titled Si Se Puede is, a, is of a boy sitting on top of the world with an open book and light radiated on his face from the book. Behind him are the planets and the universe. Ignacio's wife, Imelda, born in Mexico and raised in Los Angeles, is also an artist and a retired elementary school computer teacher. They have four children, a graduate of Harvard University, a graduate of California State University, Northridge, 
a graduate of the University of Colorado Boulder and USC, and a graduate of UCLA. Please welcome Senor Ignacio Gomez. Well, I'm gonna thank the um, Glendale Unified School District for this invitation. I'm honored and I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm an artist, I'm a designer, muralist, and I'm a sculptor. And, uh, and I was born and raised in East Los Angeles in Boyle Heights. And uh, one of my first uh, recollection of me being uh, interested in the arts is from my uncle Benny. I was four years old and he would come and visit my mom and along with my grandmother and he was also an artist, came from Mexico, worked in some of the high class uh, restaurants along Sunset and Beverly Hills. He was a waiter and a maitre d'. On his spare time, he would uh, paint desert scenes. And uh, one time he came to the house, he brought his fountain pen and uh, the well of ink and uh, some paper. And there I am at four years old. He takes out the fountain pen and the paper and the magic starts. There I am with my hand like this over the table. And, uh, and I start seeing the, his fountain pen filled up with ink. And I see his pen, fountain pen make contact with the paper and the magic begins. He draws a line and then he draws another line and then he continues doing different lines. And little did I know that when he finished, it was a tree. He drew a tree and I was just amazed. And then he continued drawing. He drew a mountain behind the tree, drew birds and the sun with the ra radiation coming from the sun and flowers. I was just so fascinated by all the work that he was doing. And uh, I said, I got to do that. So he uh, took my grandmother back home and he left his fountain pen on top of the table. And I grabbed it without anybody knowing about it. And I went under the, my bed and I hid there all day until it got dark. I was using his pen to draw like he drew. And I try to uh, remember the way uh, everything looked. And I remember my mom's legs going back and forth, calling out my name. She knew I was under the bed, but uh, she just let me be. And then, uh, and then it got dark and I came out and I ended up showing her my drawings that I did. And she was so pleased and, uh, and then uh, the next time that my uncle Benny came, he brought a tin back, uh, a tin uh, back, uh, bucket, the kind that you take to the beach with the shovel. But instead of the shovel, it was a piece of paper, uh, crayons, uh, colored pencils and regular pencils. He says, this is for you. Continue doing what you're doing because it seemed like you really, really enjoy drawing. So that was uh, opened my eyes to maybe having a future as a as an artist. But I grew up also not only having my uncle as an artist. I, my older brother uh, was a wanted to become a graphic designer, and I had two older brothers, and uh, they ended up going to Korea. One got wounded. The one that wanted to become a a designer. He went to art school afterwards at East LA College, and I saw him develop. And um, he would encourage me to continue being an artist, to continue drawing. So uh, when I was in grammar school, uh, I continued drawing. And then in junior high, I had a class in art. And then when I went to high school, I um, I wasn't able to get into art classes, uh, unfortunately, because the school had overcrowded the student body. And um, should you change it? 
Uh, there I am. And one of the things that kept me out of trouble, excuse me, uh, was building model airplanes. I started at the age of seven to start building the airplanes out of uh, balsa wood. I would buy the kits and they were like little stick, uh, balsa, thin balsa woods. And, uh, and that's what I used to do uh, until I was about 13 when my interest shifted to girls. <laughs> but anyways, it kept me busy. It, uh, it was really, uh, to me, good training to develop my eye-hand uh, skills. And uh, I really cherish this photograph of all my little model airplanes. And uh, so, so there I am uh, with the family. Uh, there were seven of us. And, uh, and somebody gave the crazy idea to my dad that with a family of seven, that uh, he could make a lot of money working in the fields. So there we went. I was five and a half when we went to the fields to work. I don't remember what fruit or vegetables we were picking, but as we were approaching the camp, uh, I remember the the illusion, the optical illusion of the fields. And I would blink my eyes real fast to even create that illusion. And then I saw kids uh, out there and adults. And I said, oh, my kid, the kids are playing in the dirt. It's going to be fun. So once we pulled into the camp, uh, there was a whole row of these uh, dilapidated shacks on stilts. And uh, we were assigned to one. And I remember walking into the, the room. It was about maybe 12 feet or 15 feet square. And I remember looking up and there's a, a light bulb hanging. And I remember uh, and the light was on and, I, and there was a moth flying around this light. So I vividly remember that. And uh, there was no running water. Uh, it was only outside. And the toilets were about 50 feet behind us. And I remember that uh, being five and a half, my brother, my, my sister and my mom would hold me so that I don't fall into the, into the toilet. And there was, it was made out of wood and I don't know what else. But uh, so we were there for pretty close to three months uh, working in the fields. And uh, I was uh, next to my mom and my sister. And I remember my my brothers and my sister uh, kept complaining that they just hated doing this kind of work. And uh, I remember I made friends with a lot of the young kids and they knew I was an artist because they saw my tin bucket and some of my drawings. And, and they would say, draw on the dirt, draw a car, draw an airplane. There I am, got, got a stick and start drawing on the dirt. And I remember one of the kids, I call him Juan, but I don't remember his real name. Um, uh, his mother uh, had a terrible accident and uh, died. She was on top of a flatbed and uh, along with some other farm workers. And it turned over in the ditch and she was killed. And at that time, my dad just got really fed up and said, we're gonna leave this place. We're gonna go back home. Uh, this is a, a terrible place to live and to, to work. So I, uh, that night, I remember the moon shining and with the light of the moon, I start doing a drawing, a portrait of the boy's uh, mother, the best I could. I was five and a half, but I knew basically the proportions of a face. So I did my best and she was a really a pretty uh, nice looking lady. And I felt bad for, for, for the son, for Juan. And uh, then the next morning I uh, approached him. I says, uh, Juan, we're going in Spanish, all in Spanish. I says, we're going to go back home to Los Angeles. And, um, and then uh, I, I, I said, uh, where do you live? And to this day, I visualize uh, like it happened yesterday. Behind him was his father's truck. And on the truck, was uh, a, a homemade uh, shack made out of wood and cardboard. And he points to the truck and says, that's where we live, that's home. And I never forgot that. And I gave him the piece of paper and I says, we're going home. 
And, and then uh, that's the last time I ever saw of him. Uh, and uh, I never got uh, in touch with a lot of the kids that I was there for uh, close to three months. And we went back to LA. Well, moving forward uh, in high school, uh, I wasn't able to get to, to take a, uh, get into an art class because of the uh, student body was just overcrowded. But I was fortunate that the school, Roosevelt High, was very diverse. Uh, all kinds of nationalities and everybody got along so well. And finally, I did get a, into an art class. I don't remember if it was 11th grade or the 12th grade. And, uh, and when I was 16, I did this uh, drawing of my room. And it really wasn't all that messy, but I kind of exaggerated. We did have a violin, we did have a frame, we did have a piano, and I did have a microscope. And uh, I had some of Brighty uh, uh, that my mom made. And uh, so it was pretty close to my room. At that time, uh, my, uh, my brothers already got married. And my other brother was, I think, in the army. So I had the room all to myself. And it was a two bedroom house for seven people. And that was kind of a challenge for everybody. And the painting on the right, there's a painting of my grandfather. I was 16 years old when I did the painting. And I remember sitting on a chair with a mirror uh, uh, and I was drawing myself to get an idea of the body uh, proportion and then drawing, trying to draw my hand uh, while holding the paper. But this is what I visualized uh, when I used to go as a little kid uh, from three on, uh, I would go back there or my my brothers would take me back there just to kind of get me out of the way. And then I would just sit there for hours and hours talking to my grandfather, whether he understood what I was saying. But to me, I knew what I was saying. But in reality, I was talking like a three-year-old one time. But as I got older, we start having a conversation in Spanish. And uh, he was a very talented uh, shoemaker. I remember that uh, the story that when my mom turned 15, uh, quinceanera, they didn't have enough money for a party or anything like that. But my grandfather made a beautiful pair of shoes, white shoes for my mom for her 15th uh, quinceanera. So, so when my teacher, art teacher saw these uh, pieces of art, he says, I, if I had you in the 10th grade, I could have probably gotten you a full, full uh, paid scholarship at the Chicago Art Institute. And that's where he went. And I thought about it. I said, no, I'm too young. I'm not mature enough to handle something like that. Uh, I was 17 when I graduated from high school. And uh, for me, because my brother worked for this one company called Trend Engineering, and then he moved on, uh, as a technical illustrator for two weeks after I graduated from high school, he trained me uh, to learn how to use the ellipse guides uh, to be an inker and to be a technical illustrator. So I went to apply where his old job used to be and I got in, I was hired. I started making, this is 19, 19, yeah, 1960. Uh, so I started, uh, they started me out uh, uh, I was making a uh, dollar seventy-five. Then, when I turned eighteen, I couldn't work overtime because I was underage. But once I turned eighteen, I worked overtime almost every night, Saturday, Saturday night sometimes, and Sunday. I mean, because the the company had deadlines, and a lot of the clientele clientele was aerospace uh, related, you know. Um, so I. Uh, so I took advantage of all that overtime. Since I turned 18, they gave me a raise and I was making $2.35. So I was making a thousand a month. And I remember I took three checks to the bank. My hair grew long because we couldn't find a barber to stay up late. So I took three checks to the bank and the lady looks at me like, looks at the check and looks at me and just, are you sure these are your checks? I said, yeah, they're my checks. And I was 18, but I looked like I was 14. Uh, 
So she went to go make a phone call and she came back. Okay, so how do you want it? Cash or do you want to uh, have a safe saving account? I didn't know anything about savings or bank accounts. I didn't know anything about banking. And I said, well, uh, I guess, uh, you know, so she just suggested uh, maybe a savings account. So to this day, I might have, I may still have some money in Bank of America, and I don't know that maybe uh, it, it just accumulated uh, more into a small fortune. I don't know. But I remember uh, we finally found a barber that would give us all haircuts, but our hair was long, and I continued working there. And then behind me, there was uh, Afri an African American named Dilly. And I showed him my artwork, and so he knew, you know, uh, what my interest was. And then I remember uh, one night uh, we were working late. He says, "Look at," and he bends over and says, uh, "Gomez, you're starting to like the money." And I said, "Yeah." He says, "You don't belong here." I said, "What? You don't belong here. You belong in art school." He said, "Look at tomorrow. Uh, uh, we don't work overtime, so you tell your mom I'm going to take you to Trade Tech." And he did. The next day, he took me off uh, to trade tech, dropped me off. And he says, you go in through that door, make a left and make a right, and you sign up for the next semester. And that's what I did. So I gave up that job to follow my dream and to be an, uh, to be an artist. So uh, I was fortunate to get into uh, trade tech and their commercial art program. And, and then after a year, uh, I was awarded a scholarship um, and, and from the art directors club. And, and then I was also doing some freelance work. And my first job was uh, when I graduated from a, a trade tech, I started working for another designer that uh, was designing uh, packages. And uh, so I, I said, well, you know, I don't want to spend all my time designing boxes of manure and, uh, and anything else that wasn't a challenge. So I said, I'll go on my own. I'll go out and see what I could drum up as far as uh, clients. So my first client was Mr. Grossman. He, uh, I don't know if he owned the company or just uh, worked. Uh, the name of the company was West, West Brass uh, Plumbing and Fixture Company. And I remember uh, he says, I'll give you five minutes, sell yourself. And I got all flustered, I sell myself. I says, I'm here to maybe do some work for you. He says, okay, I'm working in a catalog, uh, design me a cover. So I went home and designed a cover and I came back and he says, well, gee, there's a lot of white space around the design. And I said, you know, your plumbing and fixtures, that symbolizes cleanliness, taking a bath, washing your hands, uh, and you want your, your, uh, your, your bathroom looking, uh, very clean so this design reflects that and he says okay so once he printed the catalog and the cover he started getting all kinds of compliments and he referred me to other uh, of his uh, friends and there i am at 18 19 talking to these older people in their 50s 60s about their graphic design and then my second client was uh, arman I think he was Armenian and Mr. Wilson. They had a plastic company on 7th Street in Boyle Heights. So I started to design their labels and packaging and their brochures. So I was in, uh, in doing what I'd love to do, but I didn't know how to charge. So I don't think I was making too much money. And then I wanted to go to Art Center. So what I did, I went back to Trend Engineering to work all that overtime. And I was able to save uh, $10,000 in one year. I was supporting my mom and I was helping my brother try to get through school. And uh, uh, so I bought myself a little VW cash. So Art Center uh, accepted my application and they skipped me one semester because of my experience uh, going to Troy Tech. So I had enough money for three semesters. And after the fourth semester, the money dried up. I was still facing the possibility of getting drafted. And sure enough, every day, every night, I would go home and look at the mailbox to see if that letter was there. 
And it one night, one day, it was there. Greetings from Uncle Sam. Uh, so one of my brothers uh, uh, drove me to the induction center where I had to report. And him being a veteran from the Korean War, understood what was going on with what was going on in Vietnam. So, uh, so he dropped me off in downtown at eight o'clock and I went into the building and uh, I didn't see my brother or my family for the next two months. And, um, and I was drafted into the army for two years. And I remember um, uh, very depressing, but anyways, uh, when they, they took us to our barracks up in the hill, uh, it was a it was a concrete barracks uh, uh, and the bunk beds and we were allowed one uh, uh, locker and uh, we got our, our uniforms and our gear and all everything that uh, we needed and uh, and then uh, during the formation uh, the sergeant uh, yelled out says we have an artist in the company. Uh, Private Ignacio Gomez, you report to the captain. He wants to talk to you. So I go in, I salute him, set at attention. He says, at ease. He says, uh, we're going to have a battalion party. And I want you to paint some murals. And I said, my God, what are murals? What the heck is he talking about? He says, murals, I want murals. I want uh, paintings on the wall. I says, I want some big paintings. Uh, so I said, okay, okay, I, I could do that. I could do that. So, well, oh, during basic training, I just got the minimum training. E example, uh, usually they give you 11 hours of combat, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Uh, they only gave me uh, three hours because that was the, the minimum that, uh, that uh, they were allowed to give me. And then uh, I, during, when, I res when I got my rifle, I, um, uh, the, whole comp uh, the whole platoon or maybe the whole company would run three to four miles to the rifle range. And then we would shoot our rifles uh, into the targets. And then uh, uh, after a few times of running to the rifle range, the captain said that we're going to get you a Jeep and a Jeep driver to drive you to the rifle range so you could be the first one to fire your rifle and then get back, get the heck back to the company and continue painting. Because I ended up painting two giant murals in the mess hall where everybody eats and another giant mural where the playroom is at, where the pool table and the ping pong tables are at, and then another mural in the visiting room where people would come and visit with uh, with. The, the, the soldiers. And then I did a giant crest, uh, eight feet by 10 feet. And I was using house paint. I remember uh, uh, calling in my future wife. I says, you got to send me some brushes because they have these brushes that you paint a house with. And uh, so she sent uh, brushes uh, right away. So that's what I did based during basic training. Like I said, I was very fortunate. And, and, then, uh, and then when everybody was assigned to what uh, they were gonna uh, specialize in, uh, they wanted to make a company clerk out of me. I said, oh my God, I have dyslexia. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to survive that. I had a difficult time in, in schools. Uh, so there I go to Fort Huachuca and they threaten us. If you don't type 25, 35 words a minute, we'll put you in infantry. So that scared everybody. I, I don't believe they would do something like that, but that was a motivation that they instilled in us. And I ended up typing 35 words a minute. So I was shipped off to Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, I, uh, I went into the company and it was like me entering the, the Alamo because the company commander with blonde hair, blue eyes, his uh, ID guy was blonde hair, blue eyes, and his two um, uh, uh, clerks, blonde hair, blue eyes. And, oh my God, here comes a Mexican to rattle the situation. 
and uh, and then I and then uh, one of the one of the clerks says, uh, "Gomez, you could sit over there. We'll just take over. We'll just you don't worry about it. Just just you know, we'll 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 do all the necessary work." And it turns out that he was half Mexican with blonde or blue eyes, and his brother was Mexican. I mean, his uh, grandmother was Mexican, and uh, couldn't tell. But anyways. When they found out I was a terrible <laughs> company clerk, they sent me to battalion because there was an opening for a battalion artist. So I had my own little office, my table, my drafting table, and uh, they promoted me to specialist for, and I did uh, portraits, uh, I did uh, charts, graphs, I did all kinds of stuff. I painted a go-kart for one of the sergeant's kids. They had me do Christmas cards, uh, uh, decorations. Uh, so I was fortunate. You know, the Vietnam situation, the war was going on, and I saw a lot of my friends uh, being shipped out, and uh, and I was fortunate. So I uh, was determined to take advantage of the GI Bill and go back to Art Center. And at that time, they were having a, a contest, upper division contest. It was going to be a supplement that was going to appear in the New York Times. And I said, oh, here's my chance to illustrate. So I did two illustrations, two paintings, and they were accepted. And then when the, when the supplement was printed, an agent from New York saw it, contacted me through the school and says, I want to be your agent in New York. And I told him, I said, my major is advertising. He says, you should be an illustrator. And uh, you could, and, and then I, um, I said, well, I could send you some samples of stuff that I'm doing and, and uh, see where that goes. So I sent him a couple of transparencies and he sold them to Simon & Schuster and Scholastics. And one was Journey to the Center of the Earth. And, uh, and I don't remember the other ones but I remember his commission was 25%. So my wife and I received a check for $1,500. At that time, uh, I said, we're rich. I said, oh my God, $1,500. Maybe I should become an illustrator. And then uh, before I graduated, uh, there was an advertising agency that wanted to interview me. It was one of the big advertising agencies in Los Angeles. So I went for the interview and they offered me a 28 to 33,000 to start. That was a lot of money back then uh, before in 1970. Uh, but I couldn't relate to the money and I turned it down. And my advertising teacher just blew his stack. You saw me, he started telling me off. He says, you, you just had a child. Uh, you're gonna become an illustrator, you're gonna starve. Well, I must have turned white. I started shaking. My legs got real weak. And I said in a real soft voice, but it's an opportunity. I want to take it. I've always wanted to become an illustrator. I have this guy. He wants to be my agent. So he walked away. So, uh, so I graduated from Art Center with an advertising design uh, de uh, degree. Proud of that. Uh, so I started getting the commissions from New York and, uh, and I, and I had a printed portfolio before I got out of school. So, uh, so I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm working out of the house. Uh, I'm working here and my wife and my child is here. Uh, so I had my dream job. And it took me two years to make that 33,000. The following year went up to maybe 40,000 and the income just kept going up. And I got an agent in Chicago. And then, um, uh, and then in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So I was getting work from all over uh, the United States. So I was fortunate and our family was growing. So, uh, so I was uh, living a, uh, my dream. Uh, a lot of these images are from early on and some of them are, are later on. I've done work for Disney. I've done work for uh, Universal Studios. 
uh, movie posters. I even designed a, an album cover for the Beatles uh, for Capitol Records. I remember when uh, John Lennon saw the artwork, he says, no, I want to use my art. I want to use my, uh, my cartoons. I want my cartoons on the album. And the people at Capitol Records says, uh, you don't have any authority over that. Uh, we're going to just follow through on what uh, we designed and what Ignacio illustrated. So I illustrated a, a Beatles uh, album and uh, separation of degree. Uh, John Lennon re uh, reacted to, uh, to the album that I did because he wanted to use his cartoons. So I've done the work for advertising agencies, advertising campaigns, uh, editorials, uh, the stand-up, uh, uh, did one stand-up for the land before time. Uh, other artists have done different versions. Uh, the stand-up for Casper the Ghost. And just to give you the, uh, an idea how much I would get paid, I would get paid from eight to 10,000 for these stand-ups. So at that time, I mean, they were just like throwing money. I mean, uh, uh, and, and it was a dream to be an illustrator. But then the 90s came in and everything changed. Technology started to come in. The computer came in and changed everything. But anyways, uh, the it, images that you see here of Zoot Suit, that was another golden opportunity that uh, I got. Uh, I remember I did a cover for New West Magazine and the Mark Taper that was going to do the play Zoot Suit saw it, got in touch with me and they called and they asked, are you um, uh, Ignacio Gomez? I said, yes. Are you Mexican American? I said, yes. Have you heard of the play Zoot Suit? And I said, yes. He says, uh, we want you to do the new poster for the play that's going to be part of the season. I said, great. And they said, we could only pay you $300. And it's going to be in two colors, yellow and black. And I said, no, I yelled it out like that. I said, it has to be in full color, even if I have to pay for it. And my wife was standing in front of me holding one of our ch children. And her mouth dropped. And she pointed to herself like, we're going to pay for it. That's how excited I got. That's how thrilled I got. And I and then uh, the lady at the, at the Mark Taper says, well, let me give you a call back. Um, so she called back, says, look at we could pay you five hundred dollars for the poster and we're going to trademark the image under your name. And we got a printer that's going to give us a real good deal to print it in full color. So I was thrilled. So the Zoot Toot uh, poster was a first full color poster at the Mark Taper Forum. And the reaction to the play was overwhelming. I mean, it just, they kept showing it, uh, showing it and pushing the other plays back. And then they ended up making so much money that they bought the building at the Aquarius to continue the play over there. So the reaction uh, brought the attention to Universal Studios. And, uh, and then uh, they wanted to make a movie of the play. So, uh, so then uh, they had two studios designing uh, the poster. I wasn't included. And I approached one of the producers of the, of the, the movie, Phil Esparza, uh, which was one of the producers of the play Zoot Suit. I said, Phil, I want to submit a drawing for the movie. And he says, there's no money for you to do that. We can't pay you because we already have these two agencies, one in L.A., one in Texas. I said, doesn't matter. Just give me five minutes for my presentation when it comes for the for, for me to show them. He says, OK, so uh, so I came in with my version of the poster, the movie poster, and they ended up choosing mine. And then they called back after they decided to use my post, my uh, poster. It was in rough form. It wasn't a finished poster. And they asked, well, how long is it going to take for you to do the, the complete poster? He says, how long do I have? He says, you have five days. So five days to do the movie poster. I was up maybe sleepless for a couple of days, but I met their deadline. 
and I did get paid. I remember I got paid about eight, nine thousand dollars for the uh, for the poster. Well, uh, the 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 movie poster and the um, the image um, uh, is in the Smithsonian in Washington D.C. And there I am at the opening uh, gala, showing a lot of Chicano art, and uh, the zoot suit uh, is up there on top. So uh, that really introduced me to, to the whole Mexican American Latino community, the Chicano community, and uh, so it was really a landmark uh, play, and it was a movie made into a movie. And I remember the budget was three million dollars, and they had 14 days to film it at the Mark at the Acquires Theater. And I remember that they painted the the Pachuco, the the zoot suitor on the side of the building at the Aquarius Theater. So when you see the movie, it focuses on the on the painting of the of the of the Pachuco, the, the Zoot Suitor on the wall, about 20 feet high. Uh, I was overwhelmed almost in tears when I saw that for the first time. But uh, the image is now in the permanent collection in the Smithsonian. And along with some of my other work, It's in the uh, Gene Autry Museum, the uh, L.A. County Museum, uh, the uh, the Cheech Museum in Riverside, and uh, the latest is the George Lucas Museum um, that's being uh, completed and not open till 2025, I believe. And they bought one of my paintings. Uh, so I, as a commercial illustrator, have uh, several, several of my artwork in museums. And I considered myself a commercial illustrator. And usually they only collect fine artists. So here are my educational posters that I'm proud of. And in the middle are my four kids. I remember when I was asked to design a cover for a magazine called Hispanic uh, Week. And that was the beginning of Hispanic Month. And uh, So I remember I came up with the idea. It was about 10 o'clock. The kids were already in bed. And I told my wife, you got to wake up the kids. You got to wake up the kids. So they all got up in their gown and their pajamas. And I posed them like this. And I took a Polaroid photographs. And then I did the rough dry and I showed it to the uh, people that were going to produce the magazine. And that's the image that I ended up doing for the cover and for, the, uh, for a poster. So those are my four kids. And on top left is the first uh, one of the first Mexican American Chicano images that I did because I was asked to do an, an illustration that was going to try to raise money for um, um, a reading program in East LA for Latino kids. So um, right away I came up with this idea of this little this Mexican kid sitting on top of the world with the book open and the light shining in his face and the galaxy behind him. And, uh, and, and the young uh, man, that young kid that modeled for me uh, is a teacher, uh, a grammar school teacher. So I'm so proud of him. And then uh, I use my family, my kids uh, as models. Uh, and the image on the right, I use my son as the astronaut. And on the bottom right is my wife and my kids and my nephews and uh, neighborhood kids. Uh, so, uh, in a lot of these uh, images I did pro bono, I never got paid, but, uh, but uh, on the left is uh, Dr. Elena Ochoa, the first Mexican-American uh, uh, woman to go into space. And then recently there's a Mexican national that is going into space. And then there's a, a Puerto Rican that's going to be going into space. So I think... Uh, Uh, the advancement of the Latinos is is really having an impact, not only, uh, but also in space, uh, also. And then there's another astronaut, uh, Jose Hernandez, uh, that uh, was determined to become an astronaut. And he was turned down 11 times, and then the 12th time, he was accepted as an astronaut. And he flew with the shuttle, space shuttle. And they're going to do a movie of him. Um, They're going to do a movie of him. So he, th these are images that I've uh, done for the farm workers. Uh, I've been involved with uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and the, and the whole farm worker uh, movement, not only because of my experience working in the fields, but I am 
just always helping in any way possible I can. Here's a picture of my wife and I with Cesar Chavez. And the son of Cesar Chavez asked me to design the headstone where Cesar Chavez is buried. And you could see it's a stylized march with the sun on top. And the five fountains symbolize the five martyrs that were killed. And there's a portrait that uh, I did of Cesar Chavez that was used for a program. And here is the statue of Cesar Chavez. Uh, and then the memorial that I did at the, in, um, set in the city of San Fernando. It's uh, located in Wolfskill and Truman uh, in the city of San Fernando. If you get a chance, it's the largest memorial to Cesar Chavez in the country, if not the world, on 23,000 square feet. Now, this is a, a memorial that I did of Cesar Chavez for the city of Riverside. And the small uh, 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 model of the big uh, uh, memorial is now in the Department of Agriculture. So I'm very proud of, of all of the uh, memorials that I've designed. And on the right is my wife of 56 years uh, and some of the clay models before they were taken to the become moles. And here, I always want to emphasize education. The Alante kids, uh, Mijo Miga kids. A long time ago, I came up with this idea, maybe 40, 45 years ago. And I showed it to this teacher friend of mine. And he said, you got to take these into finish. Because I just showed him sketches. He said, you got to finish these. You got to finish this. Every time I would see him, he said, you got to finish the, the Mijo Mijas. And then he had a heart attack and passed away. I was heartbroken. And I told my wife, I said, no calls for two weeks. I don't care if they offer me a, a job or, or money. And I said, I don't want to talk to anybody for two weeks. So I started to finish these. And they were such a good hit that uh, they were turned into uh, t-shirts that were given away to, uh, to kids. This was a health fair in Oxnard. And uh, I'm so proud of this, uh, seeing the smile of the children uh, dressed in their Filicoreco costumes. So I'm, I'm honored to, to be asked by the Glendale Unified School District to be a guest speaker. And this image is part of a mural in the neighborhood city hall in Pacoima. It's a 60 foot mural. And also I did a, 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 a statue of a of a Gabriella Native American. I'm so proud of all the work and, and that I've done uh, to help support the Latino, the Mexican American uh, to further their education and to create positive images. Hmm? I'm, thank you so much. I, I know Giovanna's got a few questions for you. Uh, but I just have to tell you, I live in Silmar. I've been by Wolfscale and Truman. I've been to the memorial. Um, and I'm like, I like, I want your autograph. Like that's such amazing work. So thank you so much for that. Um, I know that, that we enjoy that. And I want to go check out the Pacoima City Hall thing. I want to, I want to go see that. So I missed that one, but I'll check out. I, I know I've seen the, the Cesar Chavez Memorial. So Thank you for that. Um, Giovanna, take it on. You've got the questions. Yes. Okay. So the first question is, what is one of your most memorable um, works? Well, usually uh, when it involves my children, uh, the one, the four kids, uh, I've done murals where I have them on the murals. And those are the ones that I really cherish. And of course, all the statues that I've done of Cesar Chavez. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Because I know his daughter's in the room. So these days, our kids get upset when we post their photos on Facebook. Did your kids ever get upset that that they're <laughs> memorialized forever in a statue? Uh, no, no. <laughs> they're thrilled. They're thrilled. Okay, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> um, the next question is, uh, would you change anything in the art community? And like, if so, what would it be? Um, I would bring uh, the arts back into the high school, junior high, and even grammar school. 
uh, I remember uh, even model building uh, where the kids would spend a, a class uh, building model airplanes or, or automobiles because as an artist, you could be you could design uh, automobile futuristic automobiles. I, the school that I went to, Art Center College of Design, now in Pasadena, they teach you that. They teach you how to design futuristic cars. They teach you how to design other elements. That's a great school. So there's a whole wide of opportunity uh, for artists uh, to pursue, uh, all the way from being an architect. Uh, uh, designing furniture, designing uh, pots, uh, the coffee makers, uh, those are designed by artists. Uh, the furniture, designed by artists. Uh, bridges, by, by uh, artists that are architects. Uh, industrial designers that design a lot of the uh, elements that people use every day. So, so the opportunities are out there, but it's it's a matter of you know paying tuition everything gets a, a little expensive but you have to make the sacrifice uh to get through school whatever it takes to get that degree the next question is do you have any like future works or what do you think is next for you well uh this year I did a mural uh, very on the side of a, a building, a new uh, complex building that's being built in El Monte, honoring a, a Korean War veteran. And uh, the mural is about uh, 20 feet by 15 feet. And the, the buildings, it's a whole complex of buildings that are gonna house veterans and along with other families too. And then um, I just finished doing the uh, two statues, uh, two adults, uh, two children for the uh, the the, uh, the Mendez uh, Memorial, uh, which took place in the, in the 40s when they were, the Mexican kids were deprived of going to an all-white school. So I designed the memorial, and I did the statues, and uh, they're going to install the statues next week. And uh, I don't know when the unveiling is going to happen, but maybe in about a month, uh, maybe sooner, or maybe later. I don't know. But it's going to be very uh, impressive because uh, 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 they're going to have some uh, electronic stuff where you stand in front of uh, the wall and it'll give you some information from the image that's posted on the wall. And then uh, I'm almost finished with a new pro with a, another project. And this one is a major project for a major um, uh, clinic in Oxnard. And uh, that consists of uh, 12 uh, life-size statues. Uh, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, uh, five farm workers behind, uh, behind them, and then a farm worker family, a mother, a father holding a, a child, and uh, and uh, and a, a boy and a girl holding books that says college. Uh, so that one's gonna probably be unveiled in a couple of months. So within a short period of time, well, uh, maybe uh, over two years, I ended up uh, sculpting uh, uh, 16 statues and one giant mural. And I just got commissioned to do another uh, mural for the city of Almani. Uh, to portray the history of Almani. Uh, it's going to be 90 feet long and uh, I'll get started on that in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm putting the budget together and that's my next project and there's two other statues that are pending. Uh, so, so it continues and I'll just continue working until I can't anymore but uh, uh, it's uh, I love what I do and and I have a great wife that has supported me and the family and uh, so that's important that I try to relate to the young kids you know uh, find somebody that supports you and you support them and that's one thing I tell the kids when I go talk to them that that if they want to if your wife wants to go to school you support her if you want to go to school uh, the wife will support you so that's the way it works, and that's the way it happened with me. 
Giovanna, I think we have time for one more question. Do you have one? Uh, yeah, uh, there's, if you hadn't chosen art, what would you imagine yourself doing today? If I didn't, I'm sorry? If you hadn't chosen art, what would you be doing today? I dreamed about being a baseball player, <laughs> but I didn't have the arm and I didn't have the skills, uh, uh, but a baseball player. And then if I had the brains, maybe a doctor uh, to help people. But uh, you gotta be, <laughs> you don't wanna be, a, uh, you don't wanna have a doctor that has dyslexia. You know, you don't wanna, you wanna, you wanna go that route. It just takes it longer. It just makes it longer to read, but you have certainly helped people and certainly helped your community and your culture and, and, and your country. I, I appreciate your service and um, I'm just so thankful that you shared your story with us tonight. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make sure my art teachers show your, show the video in their art classes um, because how important it is to keep arts in the schools and, and the way that you're using your art to involve your family and, um, and also the representation is just amazing. So I thank you, Mr. Gomez. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, keep up the good work. Keep up all the great artwork. Thank you. Um, thank we you. We need it. Thank you. And I'm going to go take my picture in front of those statues. So uh, <laughs> now that I know the sculptor, that, that makes it even more awesome. And if you get a chance um, to go to Riverside, uh, it's a block away from the Mission Inn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's easy to find. Well, thank you. And I want to give a shout out for um, our upcoming event on Saturday, November 5th, the 2022 Glendale Dia de los Muertos. Uh, so please, uh, you can contact them and you can create an, if you have a club or an organization and you want to create your own um, ofrenda, you're welcome to do so. Just contact them. Otherwise, come and hang out with us and enjoy the arts and crafts. And there's always some good food and some great performances. We'd love to see you all there. And next week, we have Dr. Carlos Reyes Guerrero, who is a professor of Chicano Studies um, in the department chair at Los Angeles Community College. So we are excited to have him next week. And with that, thank you to Mr. Hernandez and to our translator, Aurora, and um, Giovanna, who did a lovely job as usual. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful rest of your week and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.